tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is artist David Amico and actor, author, Joe Lucas. David Amico was born in New York and schooled in California. He earned a Bachelor's of Arts from Cal State University at Fullerton. And in 1975, he went back to New York where he took graduate studies at Hunter College. How long did you stay in New York when you went back, David? Four and a half years, Joe. And what were you doing? Why did you go to Hunter? I went to Hunter because of the faculty that was there at the time. Uh, who was that? Uh, Robert Morris, um, Susan Peterson, Joe, uh, John Mason, uh, Ray Parker. John, um, Susan Peterson wasn't the Susan Peterson from Los from California, was it? Yes, she was. And also, um, who was the other one? John who? Mason. John Mason was from here right. too. So you had to go back to New York to take classes from them. No, I was I was interested in going to New York because of the being in New York at graduate school and working with people of Robert Berry and some of the other faculty that were at. Hunter at the time. Robert Berry is also from California, isn't he? I'm not sure. He's a sculptor, sure. yes, because he's from the Sacramento area. Uh, this was the conceptual artist. Oh, then Robert it's a diff oh, different. So I wanted to go to New York. I wanted to work with this faculty, and I happened to know Susan. And so from her connection, I was able to work with her and meet John and meet a number of people that I would never have met had I not gone. So did you want to be a sculptor? I was working very physically with my paintings at that time. I was very three-dimensional with them. And uh, I just enjoyed all of the aspects of the art and all of the definitions of painting at that time. I, I think um, when I was reading an article about you, it said you really manipulated the canvas. And I think this probably shows part of that manipulation where you do all different kinds of things to it. I was putting project uh, pieces of wood were coming off of the surfaces. Uh, the, the surfaces were very physical at that time, and the definitions of painting weren't as weren't as uh, rigid as they are or have become afterwards. And what else did you do in New York? You stayed for I don't know how long. How long did you stay? Four and a half years, and I just stayed as long as I could. Um, I worked at PS One when it first opened up. I had a studio there, and uh, just was a young bohemian. Were you learning? Were you uh, uh, being with other artists at the time? Or were you a loner? I was a loner. You were. So you didn't more have enough. that camaraderie with the New York school. No, in fact I met more New York artists when I came back to <laughs> LA than I had met when I was in New York uh, in terms of uh, that kind of exchange. What were you doing uh, so that you felt it was time to come back to LA. Why did you come back to LA? I came back to LA to uh, get away from New York for a, a period of time, just a small, I wanted to get some, just a vacation. Oh, you did? And, and you I, stayed? I ran into <laughs> uh, some friends of mine from college that had moved downtown in Los Angeles and uh, where they were, looked like they were having a lot of fun. Um, it was very inexpensive, it was very exciting. And so I, I rented a huge studio for next to nothing. And I had a good time. And you stayed there ever since? And you've I've been stayed. there ever since? And I also had some uh, representation out here at the time. So. so did your big break come in New York, or did your big break come uh, in Los Angeles? Had I not been a part of PS1, I probably would not have attracted a gallery here. I see. So the big break came simultaneously in New York, having been there, having had some experience, and then being able to utilize that with uh, uh, other people being able to use like that. So, in a way, talking about the big break, it sounds like the big break is getting a gallery. Because then you have your a show, I guess, is the the, the big thing that an artist looks for. You, maybe. 
<laughs> so, but, but, <laughs> but uh, where was the, the gallery? Oh, here it was at New Space, New Space Gallery. And what kind of work were you doing at that point? Abstract, somewhat like I'm doing again now. Uh, very monochromatic, one color and also um, sort of sculptural objects, but we didn't show them at that time. Were you doing flat surfaces, or did they have texture? They had texture, very, a very tight texture, um, br a brush surface. I thought at, at one point in your career you were doing, I hate to say cartoons, but you were, there were some figures in your, your work. Got involved with figures after that. Um, uh, content became important for me after a while. I couldn't just make process paintings. So the cartoons, I was overlapping them and telling stories, and they became very important for helping me get involved with content in the work. So that's how it, it evolved from the abstract to, to these things, these figures that went into your work? Slightly, for, yeah. And then what happened? Then they changed back again? I stayed with that for five or six years. Uh, the style was uh, uh, I felt good for a while, and then I just decided that I didn't want to get a, be a part of a lot of what the style represented at that time, which was bad painting and some um, issues about figuration that I really didn't have th that kind of romance for. Do you think that, that that's a nat natural thing that happens to artists? Do, you, do they change, keep changing in their career because they've kind of like not run out of the ideas, but they become disenamored with what they've been trying to prove? Yes. I think it's important that, th that we ask questions, and I think that there's a natural time for that. Coming out of school, there's a block of time that, that is real open to asking a lot of questions, and a lot of experimentation can be done during that period. For me, that's what happened, and I took advantage of it, and I really didn't know why I was doing it uh, while I was doing it. And it was probably very, it was a very educational period for me. But as you go along, you're showing in galleries, you're having exhibitions in uh, museums and uh, different things, different venues along the way. If people show interest in this experimentation, which is what happened for me, I, yeah. I was lucky. Um, the work was going places and, and people were interested in where I was taking it. And uh, uh, it was very, it was a fun period. I enjoyed it. So now, have we come to a period that's not fun? <laughs> no, we've come to a period that is about um, s sustaining. So we're about 15 years later now. Almost. And, and so how has the work changed and how does it become sustaining? It's changed because I'm trying to um, deliver a, a solid point of view um, and stand behind the work. And is this, is this what we're talking about? Yes. This painting, this is a new painting? Right, I can't fake painting anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I have to know something about it. <laughs> so it's uh, technically and, and also con conceptually, I'm making a stand, taking a stand. Well, explain it to us, because uh, m much of our audience doesn't understand conceptual, doesn't understand abstract, and this looks, um, I don't know, well, abstract? It's playful. <laughs> playful? It, it's abstract, and it it's also has what looks like some letters or possibility of word. And it's this playfulness that my work still retains part of that knowledge of the cartooning before and the experimenting that I had done before. I try to keep this uh, a playfulness and also a seriousness going with both. Does both it have a title? It's Husio. It, the letters are a Spanish, spell out a Spanish word meaning judgment. Oh, so it does. So you see a U here. It's the J-U-I is repeated twice and the C-I-O is in the center of the box. So it's, as the, word, the letters are expanding outward, it's actually J-U-I-C-I-O is a, is a word. And so it has a, it has a verbal meaning, if you know what it means. What does it mean? I don't know. Uh, judgment. Oh, I see. So, and also, it's, just, it's an eye chart for those who want to deal with it as <laughs> an abstraction. Exactly. But I see underneath, it looks like it has layers and layers of work. Like you've, you've built layer upon layer to get to where you are now. That's part of the, the, the process that, that keeps, it, um, uh, keeps it within painting. It has, a, it has that kind of, um, it has a built up kind of quality that happens by making those decisions and allowing for chance to come in. One, one of the things that I read uh, that you had said in a statement about art was that you like to put the spirit into your work, how, how uh, or 
get in touch with the spirit within? Do you get in touch with the viewer's spirit within or your spirit within? Uh, partially both. Like in, in this case, the, the word didn't come to me in the beginning of doing the painting. It wasn't just a very black and white idea. The layering happened because I was fooling with a lot of different solutions for it. And so as I, as I was developing these solutions and taking away and adding them, there was a poetic kind of juncture that came about where it all made some sense. And that's where touching, when you go through a process over a period of time and it all comes together and it begins to speak to not only you, but hopefully other people. And you, you have that kind of confidence with that point. You also say that you have like to stimulate people to see things. How do you stimulate people to see things? Well, if you can keep the process <laughs> of the painting clear uh -huh. throughout this, and it comes together in the idea, and the final solution makes sense, and it looks great, um, you hope, and generally speaking, it's not only clear to yourself, but it's clear to whoever sees it. It seems a little bit funny to me because words that describe David Amico are personal and private and not uh, maybe shy I don't know quiet and to see yes. that <laughs> to see that you're um, in touch with people that way you're giving of your personal bits yeah. to, to the outside world that's the painting process it's a quiet stage but it's just as um, it's just as entertaining if you if you look as any other um, um, any other field of communication. Uh, talk about the painting behind us before we, we That's leave. That's Kite. It's Kite. Kite? Right, and both of these paintings are, are part of a body of work that I'm working, have been working with for the last two years. And uh, it's trying to be even more abstracted and more distant. Um, I'm still working with some of these ideas, but this one was uh, a little bit playful. So, you talk about your giving of yourself, what other influences come into your, your work? In terms of? In terms of getting to the point where you are. Does the outside world influence you? Yes. If you take a trip, does it influence you? My environment does. The studio downtown. Um, but how much can you get out of just being in the studio? I mean, you're in the same space. You've been there for what, 15 years? 15 years. I drive around a lot in, oh, yeah, in, the, in the industrial areas surrounding the city. And I'm talking about urban life. I'm talking about the people surviving not only downtown, but in the high rises that are close to downtown, in the different uh, ethnic neighborhoods, oh. uh, Alvarez Street and uh, Grand Central Market, Little Tokyo, all, all within a 10 minute walking distance. You, you're experiencing three or four countries uh, culturally. Little, um, it's quite amazing. So and then that's, that's what brings into you, comes into you. And then the, the, the uh, international language of industry also, and, uh, and just people working together, living together. It happens every day. Do you teach? I teach uh, once in a while. <laughs> where do you teach? I teach where, when I'm asked. <laughs> and I'm, right now I'm teaching at uh, UCLA and Claremont and at Cal State Fullerton. And what, what, what is the subject? What do you teach? Mm -hmm. Uh, m more or less upper division or graduate students. I see. So you work together. Do you paint actually when you're teaching or do they paint? Uh, they paint. I go <laughs> in and they tell me what they want me to know and then I have to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how teaching works. <laughs> no, I go in and I try to talk to them. Um, but generally speaking, they're asking the questions at this point in time in their career and coming up with the solutions in terms of their work. And so I go in and just try to see if I can make sense of it, and if it's clear to me then, and others like me, um, then they have a pretty good idea if they're successful or not. They're pretty smart, actually. The students that are coming through right now are pretty, um, gonna be pretty good artists. Well, I think one thing that you've taught me, and I hope he's taught all of you out there, is to ask questions, to think, to look at something with a different point of view. I didn't know this really was uh, lettering. I, I well, thought it was your abstract, uh, way of saying something. They, are, they were found objects that were, were able to, to doubly uh, use, find themselves to be useful. So you've, you've opened my eyes today and I hope he's opened your eyes. And don't go away, we have someone else who's going to open your eyes, Joe Lucas, who's uh, an actor. He's going to do a little performance for you. We'll be right back. Thanks, David. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with actor-writer Joe Lucas, and we're on this beautiful set that uh, has paintings by David Amico. Joe Lucas graduated from the UCLA School of Theater and Film. He was a regular on Days of Our Lives and in the Brady Bunch revival, which was the Bradys, I guess. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Joe's been a member of Theater West for the past 11 years, where he's really worked a lot. Uh, he wrote and performed in an autobiographical one-man show titled Once a Man, Twice a Boy. Was yeah. this something you always wanted to do? Well, um, I really hadn't thought about doing a one-man show until about three years ago. A friend of mine suggested. Uh, he felt that with my knack for accents and dialects and dialogues that I would be, be very, do very well in a one-person show. And uh, I said, well, that's a nice idea. What am I going to write about? And then I remember that 10 years before, when I was studying with Nina Foch, um, and she's a very tough teacher. In fact, in the year that I studied with her, there's only one thing I saw her like that anybody did. <laughs> Happened to be me. Oh, bravo! <laughs> and it was, bravo. well, it was where she gave us this ac uh, exercise where we had to take an object and describe it physically and then talk about why there was an emotional attachment to that object. And the object I chose was my grandfather's handkerchief. My grandfather died a very slow death in the mines. This is my grandfather, my mother. Well, let's side. wait. Let's talk about the mines. Oh, Where yeah. are you from? I'm from Pottsville, Pennsylvania. And it, and we're talking about the coal mines. Yes, the coal region of Pennsylvania. And it's all the coal dust and all oh, that. Oh yeah, it's in the Appalachian Mountains of Pennsylvania. Okay, so. go on. Yeah. So <laughs> I took. <laughs> I just want to make sure we all oh, know absolutely. what we're talking about. Absolutely. Well, listen. Then Nina was knocked out of her chair. I took uh, the handkerchief. I described it as she told me to to physically describe it, and then talk about why there's an emotional attachment. So I talked about my grandfather and what life was like back there, and how we were born into debt, and how difficult it was to get out of those mines, and how how life was like for my father and his brothers and by the end of this story she was in tears she was just dissolved and I never saw her have that reaction before since to anything but it was all so true it's true it's a true story yeah so and and it it was so moving to her I shelved it in the back of my mind I said somewhere somehow this is gonna pay off I don't know how well then three years ago when this friend suggested I do a one-person show I thought let's try that so I took a bunch of stories about my childhood and things that my father had told me about things that went on you know, before me in my family, my grandfather, great-grandfather. My grandfather was a very big boxer, by the way, Mike Lucas. Oh, is that right? Yeah, he beat Art Sykes, and he was Joe Lewis's sparring partner. Well, then how did he have time to work in the mines? Did he work after or before? Well, at that time, uh, unless you were Joe Lewis, you really didn't make that much money as a boxer during the Depression. Uh -huh. You know, also there was a lot of pressure on him from the town and from the priest to come back and take care of his family because he's out in the road all the time. Right. You know, so he did give up his boxing career to come back to the mines. But he became the first mine owner from the other side of the tracks. Oh, so he proved that you didn't, you weren't bound to always be underground. Well, uh, <laughs> he tried, and then the other mine owners got together and they blew up his mine. <laughs> oh, then he didn't. Do it. <laughs> That's the way they did things back then. Oh boy. So yeah, it was a horrible life, and all of that, as I say, came out in the monologue. And I began putting that story and all these other stories about my grandfather and the other mine owners getting together and blowing up his mine and our struggle to get out and make something of ourselves. I put it up at a Monday night workshop at Theater West. And everyone was astounded. People were blown away. Particularly Betty Garrett. She took a strong interest in the piece. And I really put a lot of store in what she thinks. I, I really value her judgment. So for the next two, 52 Monday nights. <laughs> oh, did you do it? I did. Every, every week I put a different story up. And Betty was there every week. And Norman Cohen, who is our, uh, our moderator, was there. And they encouraged me. And they drew stories out of me. And finally, after a year, I had a play. So I began workshopping the play. I pulled Mark Travis into it. And, oh, so uh, that's how it all came about. Yeah, that's how it, it came didn't up. come out of the Brady Bunch. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> or Days of Our Lives, or where days, I was a gang member. <laughs> or Days of Our Lives. What were you in Days of Our Lives? I was a gang member. I was in Emilio's gang. I was one of the Stingrays. Well, how could you be so tough? You don't look like you have like a tough look about you. They put a scar on me and a bandana. I had longer hair. And uh, then I got stabbed. <laughs> Did you have an accent? <laughs> no, no, I was just this kid. I mean, even though I do have a facility for accents, uh, at the, they didn't want one. 
uh, for some reason. So, so, I didn't so it. this didn't come because this material is extremely serious material. Yes, it is. It's very heavy. It's it's a heavy story, and it's a grim way of life back there in the mines of Pennsylvania. When you talk about doing a one-man <coughs> show, and you said mm -hmm. you brought Mark uh, Travis, who's a, yeah. a wonderful oh, a director. Probably the best director of one-person shows there is. Yeah. How? Um, why can't you direct yourself? It's all your own material. It's everything that you know about. Yeah, but you know, when you grow up in a place like that, you take so much for granted. And you, you assume everyone lives the life you have. Mm. And so when I described some of the atrocities back there, I didn't think they were atrocities because I lived them. Mark would just be rivet and he'd say, no, Joe, you can't gloss over that. Furthermore, this needs to be explained. This needs to be brought oh. out. And then there are other things that you think are important, and they're really not. I see, but so <laughs> so you, we edited those. So you just take his judgment. You That's take right. this person. Does he also uh, have something to do with the choreography, your movement on stage, what you do? Yes, but you know what's interesting is a lot of the, the, the blocking that I started out with, that I discovered and felt intuitively, is still in the show. Now, you didn't write this because it's uh, politically correct right now. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, so I get a few zingers off though. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Because so, well, ma yeah. so many of these one person plays are uh, really politically motivated. Oh, I know. I but know. yours is uh, mine is a tribute to my family and the suffering and the sacrifice that they went through. Well, let's uh, let's listen to okay. what, a, sure. I don't know, a little bit. Set sure. us up a little bit and sure. you don't mind doing something, no, do you? No. Well, I had a fraternity brother at UCLA he asked me why I am the first person to have gone to college in my family. He asked me why, why didn't anybody else get out of those mines before? And I tried to explain to him that when my father was born, he was born into debt. That's a debt he inherited from his father and his father's father. Everything they ever owned, the first pair of baby shoes, the food they ate, the clothes on their backs, and then when it came their turn to go down into the mines, the ropes, the shovels, the, even the coal car you loaded with the company's coal had to be bought or rented from the company on the company's terms. And at the end of the week, you got what was known as a bobtail check. A bobtail check isn't how much you're being paid. That's how much you owe the company after your expenses have been deducted from your wages. Now, legally speaking, you couldn't go anywhere in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania till you satisfied your debt to the company. And the company made sure that debt was never satisfied. Now, when FDR was elected and, and some of the New Deal politicians, well, they passed laws banning this kind of institutionalized slavery. But you know, a generation or two before that, if you tried to leave town while well, you still had a debt to the company, you could be shot in the back for being a thief because you were stealing what the company owned, namely you. That was a, a scene from Once a Man, Twice, twice a, a Boy. boy. I think you became Twice a Boy with that, right? <laughs> yes. yes. Those were very, you. very poignant and mm -hmm. also probably things that the rest of the people in the United States didn't know. Oh, I know. And, you know, that's the reaction that we have all the time. People feel like they've just had the most incredible history lesson of their life. They didn't realize there's such a thing as a, as a coal and iron police. The coal and iron police was a private army. This was hired, trained, and paid for by the coal companies. And every coal and iron policeman had a prison record a mile long. And when you talked about you were born to debt, yes. I think people think you're saying we were bo born and we were going to die. That's but right. you were born and you owed the company money. That's right. You owed the company. And if your father died, you had to go. My grandfather went to work for the company when he was five because his father was killed in a mining accident. So let's get you to UCLA. How did you get out of there? <laughs> well, um, I got accepted. Uh, I got some scholarships and some grants, and um, I was able to swing it. Did you think you were going to be an actor? Yes. I oh, did. you did? I did. I thought somehow I'm going to be an actor, and that's why I'm going to choose UCLA School of Film and Theater, and uh, we're going to see where I go from there. And, and what was your big break? <sighs> oh... Of, I would say probably getting into Theater West because um, in addition to being such a prestigious 
rep company, it um, also provided me with a lot of showcase opportunities. That's how I got in the Brady's. Getting the, in, getting in. You mean you have to audition? You audition to get in the Oh, you do? Oh, yes. oh, I didn't know that. Oh, it's very hard to get in, yeah. Oh, I see. So yeah. that was the big break. Well, yeah, uh, Theater West started Rob Reiner off on his career. It also started off Richard Dreyfus. Richard Dreyfus grew up on the stage at Theater West, as well as Jack Nicholson, Sally Field, and a lot of other people. So, um, and how many people do they have uh, in rep at one time? Our company consists of about 150. So you're always shifting. Do you work with each other? Yes, we work with each other. We help each other. We have, we have a musical comedy workshop on Thursday that Betty Garrett runs and Gogi uh. Grant uh, participates in, and we help each other. And, of course, people are at different levels in terms of their musical work. But then Monday night is the main workshop. That's the actress workshop that Norman Cullen does. And what are you, um, do you still go on auditions for films? Do you still yes. take classes? Uh, my life has been consumed with this show. I, I really have done nothing but the show now for about a year because Mark Travis and I have been workshopping it. And we've had lots of offers. We, we've had an option, a film option has been offered to which we're, you know. Why is a one person on. show so great? Well, I think they're economical, and I also think that they give, in terms of film for the industry, it's a great opportunity to have an interesting story expanded into something that could be successful as a film. Even if one person does it, then you can you bring all these characters oh, yeah. into it? Because then they can see that all those characters can be played by different actors and it could become a story. Do you play characters, or do you just tell the I story do. yourself? I play a lot. I play... Um, Many different characters. I use about 12 different dialects in the course of oh, the show. Oh, you do? Yeah, I do. Oh, we have to rap. Give us one rap that Access. says goodbye. And says an in one of our accents. Well, we've, I've had a lovely time here being with you, and I hope you come to the show. Oh, Father Lucas, <laughs> thank yes, you yes. so much. Is that <laughs> My it blessing was? on you. Thank you so much. <laughs> You'll be assumed into heaven, I can tell. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm so happy. This is a wonderful day for us. <laughs> there you go. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Joe Lucas. My pleasure. Thanks to all of you for watching us on the Joan Quinn Profiles, and thanks for writing those wonderful letters. If you want to know anything or you have any questions to ask, please um, ask us and write to 520 South Grand, 8th floor, Los Angeles, 971.